Welcome to our webinar, Buying a French Property and the Tax Implications of Living in France, sponsored by Blevins Franks. My name's Karen Tate, and for the past 20 years, I've been editing French Property News and attending our property exhibitions. I'm joined today by our French property experts, George Shepherd, Blevins Franks, and Anthony Bryan of Beauvillage Estate Agency. We'll start with some information from each of them about what they do, and then we'll get stuck into all the questions you've already sent in. We'll also be able to submit questions while we're live. Apologies if we don't get round to answering all of your questions, but you can get in touch with us via email afterwards. We'll also have a couple of polls running during the webinar for you to take part in only if you wish. The webinar will be recorded and sent to you afterwards in case you want to watch it again or you've missed anything. So over to George. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is George Shepherd, and I am a partner for Blevins Franks based here in the Bergerac office. Um, a little bit about me. I started my career in the early 90s with a big pension trustee company called Sedgwick, who then became Mercer. Um, I then set up my own business 10 years after that and built that up over a 10 year period. Sold that in 2008 to Skipton Building Society. Then latterly I was discretionary manager with Fisher Investments UK and now been here with Blevins Franks for around about the last two and a half years. My wife and I moved to Bergerac from Edinburgh um, we are now well into the system here in France, which is quite important from Blevins Frank's point of view, as they like their partners living in the area where um, our clients are. We as an organization are probably certainly Europe's largest wealth manager. We have uh, over 40 years in the business. We've got 20 offices throughout Europe and um, very regulated both in the UK and now, of course, passported to here in, in France. Um, so that's a little bit about, about me and um, Ruth. Lovely, thanks, George. And uh, over to Anthony now. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anthony Bryan. I'm a senior sales manager with Beauvillage Immobilier in Southwest France. I've lived in France for 22 years, 18 of which I've been in real estate having initially run my own company for 12, 13 years. Um, we teamed up and merged our company with Beauvillage a few years back. Lovely, thank you, Anthony. We've had a few questions about viewing properties at the moment. Um, what are the practicalities for people planning viewing trips, for example? Um, someone asked if quarantines and COVID tests are required both ways. That one's for Anthony. Um, as far, the latest information that we're given is there's no need to justify your reasons to travel to France at the moment. However, you are supposed to carry a sworn statement, um, which you sign. You can find that on the French government website uh, to say that you're not suffering from any symptoms of COVID. Uh, the requirements for travel on top of that are a negative PCR test under 72 hours before travel. And then once in France, you're expected to self-isolate for seven days and then take another PCR test at the end of those seven days um, to prove that you're still negative. And once that's proved, once you've got that back negative, you can then carry on with your life as normal in France. I believe going back into the UK, there is still, because France is on the amber list uh, within the UK, there is a need to quarantine on return to the UK as well. Okay, thank you. So it's, it's not entirely uh, trouble free traveling to France at the moment and some people may want to get their property search started but not actually travel. So can they literally buy a property from their sofa in the UK? Um, yes, they can. And it has happened and it does happen. Although the vast majority of our sales are still through physical viewings. We have 
um, sold a number of properties through virtual viewings and 360 degree tours, which is fast becoming the norm within our um, estate agency. Um, I wouldn't necessarily advocate not visiting and viewing physically, although if you want to go down that route, I think you should be putting your trust in somebody that you hold in high regard and also make sure that you have all the information to hand. Okay then, um, so it is possible, but um, maybe not completely advisable to do the whole process virtually. Um, we actually have a really interesting article about that from, from one of your colleagues, Anthony, in the July issue of French Property News, so people can consult that if they want to uh, find out more. So moving on to tax, George, we've had a question about inheritance, specifically what is the inheritance tax for children inheriting a French property from their last surviving parent. So perhaps you could cover the tax rates for them and for other heirs. Yeah, okay, Karen. I mean, I think what I would say, first of all, um, it, it depends if the individual is a French resident at time of death. Um, it's French succession tax here in France, not UK inheritance tax. And the succession tax and the laws are effectively the equivalent of the UK, but here in France, with a number of quite significant differences. There are, however, um, a number of factors which would and need to come into play here, including the parents' marriage regime, perhaps also to look at how the ownership of the property was arranged at the time of purchase. It may have been on Tontine, it may have been on Division, or, for example, um, an usufruit that might have been set up. So that effectively means that on first death, if that usufruit had been put in place, tax payable on the second death can be considerably reduced. And a usufruit simply means that the surviving spouse has the right to remain in the property, but the freehold, a freehold of the property belongs to the, the children. But apart from that, for direct line beneficiaries, each child receives 100,000 100, euros tax-free before tax is payable, and rates range from 5% to 45%, depending on the value um, of, of inheritance. But it is a quite a complex area, but there, there does need to be a bit of research done for each specific case before a proper answer can be given to that specific ind individual. Right, so ideally people should really look at uh, how they structure their purchase at the point of buying it to make sure they can pass on their property in the most tax efficient way when the time comes. Absolutely, and it would be most unusual for any property in France to have been bought without the notaire discussing that with the individual. Um, some of them have to be done on the paperwork at the beginning. When my wife and I bought our house, it was on division. So I would be surprised that there wouldn't be some sort of arrangement put in place at the very beginning. And, and Anthony will probably confirm that it is something that should be part and parcel of the list as to what one needs to do before you buy a property. And that is just to say to, to uh, um, our audience, it, it, it is slightly different in France, isn't it? Because you can set up different marital regimes when you buy, which has an effect. So it is something people should definitely look into before they buy. They should consider their estate Most planning definitely. before they buy. Okay, great. Um, Anthony, okay. we've got a few questions about buying a home with sheets um, perennially popular with Brits. What should prospective property buyers take into consideration? Uh, there's a few things to look at on this one. Um, and I think one of the most important is probably its location. And the location needs to be uh, adapted to what you want to do with the sheets. A lot of people are looking uh, for businesses where they run, for instance, catering holidays, cycling holidays, wedding events. Um, there's all sorts of different things at the moment. And you've got to be basically in the right location to be able to conduct that type of holiday rental. 
Um, the other thing I would say is very important is your budget is going to come into play enormously. And the budget, um, you budget according to the area you're buying in because France being such a vast country, the value of property varies enormously from one region to another and from one department to another. So you've got to look and consider carefully how much you've got to spend if you want to be earning some money out of uh, running holiday sheets. Um, another thing well worth considering is when you're buying a property, is it photogenic? Because a picture paints a thousand words and your first impression is that photo that you see as you're scrolling through hundreds of properties on a website. And if it doesn't grab someone's attention, then I'm afraid they're just gonna pass it by. So if it's not photogenic, can it be photogenic, for example? Um, and the last thing I'd probably say is that running sheets can provide you with a supplementary income, but in general terms, you, I wouldn't expect it to be your main source of income. It's more top up. It will cover extras. It'll cover your property overhaul, maintenance, things like that. Um, unless your investment in the property is significant, you're not likely to gain a good living from it. Right. So again, do your research first. Make sure your location is suitable for the for the guests you're expecting to receive, and don't necessarily expect to make a fortune unless you've got one of these vast cheap complexes with yeah loads of properties. It's more of a a top up, as you say. Great. On the tax side, George, um, someone's asked what percentage of tax is paid on jeep businesses. Um, we have another question from someone buying a holiday home in Normandy with a sheet to rent out who wants to know if there are any tax implications they should be aware of. Yeah, okay, and, and following on nicely from Anthony, he's absolutely correct. The clients that I have come across who want to take income from a sheet, it, it is a top up scenario, and yes, it, it is taxable income. Most of the clients that I've come across, the regime is subject to the micro BIC regime. And it effectively means that if your turnover for that Jeep business is less than, say, 176,000 euros, a very generous flat 71% of that income is deducted, leaving only 29% taxable. Um, obviously, it's important that the individual to obtain that um, has the business set up appropriately and registered with a CIRIP number received. And there are also quite a number of other variants which would apply here. So again, it's really important to seek the appropriate advice so that you don't set up the business incorrectly. To unravel here in France can be challenging, so it's really important to get it correct at the beginning. The income tax rates would be the normal income tax rates that apply here in France with your sliding scale. Um, so much to zero, so much to 11, so much to 30%. And there is also social charges applied on investment and of course, a rental income, which is running at about 17.2%. So the answer to the question, yes, it's taxable. Yes, it's subject to social charges. And yes, it's normally viewed as a top-up income to your pension income, to your investment income, to, to all the other sources of income that, that, that you may have. Lovely, thanks, George. So it's time now for our first poll, which should be appearing on your screen. So, Anthony, we've been asked for some basic um, buying information like the best way to find properties and with pricing geared towards locals not expats uh, does that actually happen is there one price for locals and a higher price for foreign buyers as this uh, question is suggesting and what are the basics buyers need to know i think you're still on mute anthony thank you thanks karen uh, no, there's certainly not one price for the locals and one for people from outside of the local area. Um, as agents, we all have the same price or net uh, vendor price that we are um, have a contract with the vendor. There may be slight discrepancies when you have um, agencies which have a higher commission rate than others 
or some with a lower commission rate, you might have a few thousand euros of difference. Um, but generally uh, speaking, everyone has the same price. Um, one thing I would say is you do have an awful lot of direct vendor to buyer sales within France as a, as a whole. And you may see property advertised on uh, direct sale websites at a lower price than you will see on the agent's website, because obviously the agency fee is not involved. Um, for the French buyer who's used to doing that, then entirely up to them how to go about the business. I wouldn't, again, advocate a direct purchase um, in France. If you don't know what you're doing, you can get yourself in a whole world of mess. Um, so again, use an agency that's used to dealing in the international market and they can handhold you through a purchase and they can even do often a lot of after sales care for you. Lovely. So unless, as you say, you're very familiar with the French market and you're um, very fluent, it is recommendable to, to use an agent who will be able to guide you through the process. They'll earn their fee. <laughs> So, George, um, a tax question. When moving to France, is your tax owed for the first year based on what you earned in the financial year in your previous country? And the question comes from someone living in Australia, but presumably it would apply equally if you've been living in the UK as both are outside of the EU. Yeah, I mean, it would. Um, the, the answer to that, quite simply, is, is no. Um, tax in, in France will be based on what you earn as a French resident from the very date that you arrived in France, or the date that you become a French tax resident. So any income and gains generated in Australia prior to that date or in the UK are not taxed. It is quite nice, particularly, I can't speak for Australia, but particularly in the UK, it, it is possible to complete a, a form P85. It's a nice thing to do. It allows the HMRC to know when you are leaving the UK, um, and it then allows you to have a start date here in France. But there's no French tax paid on any earnings. Or, or gains prior to you becoming here in France. And once you arrive in France, the tax year begins on January the 1st and ends uh, on December the 31st. It is treated pro rata. So if you come on the 1st of July, you will have six months of this current year that you will need to declare to the French tax authorities before the end of May next year. We're now on a PAYE system effectively similar to the UK and you will then pay staged payments thereafter between September and December. But the, the answer to the, the question is that you, you will only start paying French tax from the date that you arrive and become a French tax resident. Okay, great. Thanks, George. So, Anthony, um, a buying question. Is it better to buy a cheap ruin to renovate, and we've all seen those tempting properties online for sale, or to pay a higher price for a property that's already been renovated? Good question. Um, again, entirely depends on circumstances. Uh, do you have the time on your hands to go down the route of renovating a property? Sometimes those properties that you see on online um, they're in fabulous locations often remote locations and hence why nobody has renovated them before um, but often that is what a lot of people want as well to be remote and have fabulous views um, but there's a lot of questions to ask regarding renovating a property um, one being the time factor two is trust in people that are gonna do the work for you or can you do the work yourself? If you can, obviously it's gonna be a lot cheaper. Uh, the third thing to consider is the cost of renovation in France is quite considerable. Um, probably higher than the UK, I would imagine, uh, for various reasons. And although it might be something you've always dreamed of, it might not be financially within your capability to do that renovation. Um, but that said, you will get exactly what you want at the end of it because it will be to your taste and to your spec. So if you've got time on your hands and you've got the money and that's what you want to do, then 
enjoy it and go from down that route. But if you haven't got the time on your hands or the time on your side and you want to enjoy your property immediately, then buying something ready done is probably more for you. Lovely, thank you. And always the thing to watch out for when you're renovating, which is a lot easier said than done, is not to let sp uh, costs spiral out of control or time scales go crazy, especially if you're, uh, say, renovating a sheet or something and you need the income. But many beautiful renovated properties out there and many fantastic uh, renovation projects waiting the right people as well. OK, so, George, we've been asked by someone who has sold the house in the UK and has some of the proceeds as cash in their bank account. And they want to know, are there any tax efficient ways of investing that would provide them with an income in France? Um, yes, there is. But, but before I answer that question, a lot of the questions I get will be twofold. One will be, I haven't sold my house in the UK. I will do possibly in the future, I'll rent it out, or I have sold it and, and, and the money's in the bank in, in this particular case. But as Anthony has already said, what I find is that first of all, people buy a property, then it's recommended that in France that we'll normally hold a capital sum for renovations. Then they should be looking at what do I have left? Um, have I disposed of my UK ISAs, for example? Premium bonds, who are not um, types of investments recommend, uh, not recognised here in France. So you tend to find people buy the house, set aside renovations, and then they have um, money left over that's probably needing to earn good returns and provide a facility to draw down income. And um, one of the most popular routes of investment is an assurance V, which we do um, a lot of. And these are highly tax efficient for individuals in France. If you have them with no income drawdown, uh, assurance Vs can grow, roll up without any um, CGT withdrawals. If you're going to draw down a yield of say 4% um, or whatever you take um, within growth um, parameters, uh, are taxed very favourably. So to give an example, if you have an investment in an assurance V portfolio and in a 12 month period it grows by say 7% and you take an annual withdrawal of say 25,000 euros, you will only pay tax on the 7%, the growth element, effectively 1,750. So 23,000 is roughly tax free and you're only then paying the tax on that at a, at a rate of 30%. So they're, they're super for tax efficiency on income, on CGT. They're particularly useful for couples who have children or families from, from different sort of um, sources in relation to previous marriages from a succession point of view. So the Assurance V is a wonderful all-encompassing wrapper that most people in France at some stage will have them, and they are extremely useful for all the tax mitigation and of course to provide income and that income will be added to their pension income will be added to their GIT income and it all goes a long way now to make sure that they have more than the minimum salary that is roughly about 1200 euros a month under the new regime. So they're extremely, extremely efficient for that. Uh, and that would be an assurance fee. Okay, very interesting. Thanks, George. Anthony, um, someone's asked about buying a small plot of land. They don't actually say whether it's to build on or not. I'm kind of presuming they do. But either way, what's the process of buying land in France? And is there anything they need to take into consideration? Thanks, Karen. Um, Land purchases go through down the same route as buying a house in France, so everything will go through a notaire. Um, the, the conveyancing is identical, the check into ownership, previous ownership. One thing you do need to make sure of, though, if you're buying a plot of land and you want it for specific use, you need to check what urban area or what zoning it's in with your local council. So, for instance, it could be natural zone, which means that you're not able to do anything on that land. It could be a building zone, it could be, could be commercial building zone, or it could be agricultural zone. Uh, there, there are other variations on that as well. Um, so if you're wanting it for a specific thing, 
then you need to use conditions in the purchase contract, which will allow you to have um, a peace of mind that you're getting at the end of it, what you want out of it. So if you want, for example, to build a house on it, you need to apply for a CU and put that in as a condition, a CU being a certificate de albinisme, and that being a condition in the sale. And then you will not be able to complete on that piece of land until you've got clean um, certificate and you know that you can do what you want to do. Okay, thank you. So yeah, the, the message very clear there. Make sure um, when you're buying land that you can do with it what you wish to do with it, or you might have a useless to you piece of land on your hands. Okay, lovely. Um, George, another tax question. Um, it says, We've owned a house in France since 1992. It's never been let out. We've never derived any income from it. Will Brexit have an impact on how we manage the house expenses? They've also asked if there are any plans for the French to increase community taxes for overseas owners. Okay, I mean, obviously, firstly, Brexit will not have any direct impact on how you manage your house expenses. Obviously and clearly currency fluctuations will always need to be taken into account for these general expenses, but that's always been the case. Um, we at Blevins Franks in relation to community taxes are certainly not aware of any changes to community taxes for overseas owners or people here in France. Um, at the moment, you'll know that the tax habitat which is paid on a residential property is to be reduced and has supposedly from 2020 had about 80% um, exempt. It's, it's based on your income. So if you have reasonable levels of income, you will currently still be paying tax habitation. However, they say it will hopefully be removed by 2023, but we shall have to see. Um, the tax foreign share will continue to be paid by the owner, irrespective of who owns the property. There are deductions and exemptions available for the elderly occupants of new houses or renovated properties. That's sort of something that you would need to take advice on. But certainly the land tax element is, is, is almost always payable. But to answer the question quite simply, Brexit will have no direct impact on how you manage your house expenses at this time, at this stage. Great, right, thank you. Um, Anthony, we always receive uh, questions about the best places to buy in France. And obviously this is very much based on your own personal preference. And France is such a huge country with so many differences in culture and landscape and lifestyle and, and so on. Which areas are you finding are particularly popular with overseas buyers at the moment? Um, I, I'll probably say I'm biased here because I think I live in one of the most beautiful areas of, of the whole of Europe and I'm down the road from George. You'll probably agree with me on this. Um, we cover an area which is, as an agency, probably as big as the country of Wales itself. And to be perfectly honest, the demand is pretty high all over the countryside at the moment and that's largely due to the pandemic situation um, so I can't say which areas are the hottest because it's pretty much all over to be honest all over the southwest you're talking about I'm talking about in my experience all over the southwest yes okay and that that um I would say that reflects our experience at French Property News with readers that people the southwest is still very popular and also um Brittany and Normandy, that whole sort of west side of France is always very popular. The south coast, I would say, is popular, but uh, a lot of people are priced out the, the Riviera. So, okay, that's good. Um, George, a question now from someone whose fiance was self employed working for agencies in the UK. Now he's in France, he wants to pay tax in the UK, not France, although they are resident in France, living in France. But he may be able to return every now and then to work in the UK. Is that possible? I see some of the questions coming up relating to this, um, but what, what I would say here is it's, it's unfortunately 
um, not something that you can choose where you pay tax. Um, in France, the, the, the law and, and the regulations are such that if you have your main residence, your foyer here in France, you will be a French tax resident. If you spend more than 183 days, you will be classed as a French tax resident. If your principal activity is here, the centre of your economic activity is here, but you can still earn in the UK and pay UK tax um, in this case. But what then happens is that the double tax treaty comes into effect. So one of the things to be very clear after Brexit, yes, there's been a lot of changes, but there has been no change and no impact on the double taxation treaty that exists between the UK and France and the other 26 countries. So if you have UK employment and pay UK tax, you still record it on your French tax return, but the double tax treaty will come into play so that they will make an adjustment on your code to credit or, or more. And it's to determine your overall French, overall French tax rate on all your other income. Um, but you cannot choose where you pay tax. It's dependent on the domestic and international law here in France. Um, the only thing I would point out, and I have had this occasionally, and my colleagues have come across it occasionally, if, if you're working for a UK employer, living in France, it's important that you tell the UK employer clearly that you're doing that because they will have social charges and tax to pay that they might not be aware of. And we have had situations where people forgot or didn't tell their employer two years down the line and the employer gets a huge um, tax bill, penalty and all sorts um, of problems. Um, but it is it is possible where work is performed in both countries to have conditions met, but it's the double taxation treaty that's the big one, and it's very useful. Right, so double tax treaty, you won't be taxed twice. If you're living, if you're permanently resident in France, you come under French tax regime. And uh, if you're still working yeah. for your employer, probably best to let them know you're living in France because it will affect them as well. And I know as well as the tax situation, it also um, has legal implications too. So some very good points there. Thanks, George. Um, it's time now for our second poll on property budgets. There it is on your screen. So I allow you to answer that and we'll move on to our next question. So, um, Anthony, this relates, oh no, sorry, I've got one for George here. It's a pension question. So if someone moves to France, can they still keep and draw on their UK personal pension? Um, yes, they can. And I, I did see another question. There's some of the UK pensions at the moment that are already in payment, like local authority, um, government pensions, they pay tax in the UK at source. Again, the double taxation treaty comes into effect. And again, the adjustments are made in the, co in the code. However, if you haven't yet started to draw down your final salary pension scheme or your defined contribution or personal pension, it is extremely important that you do have an analysis made on that to see whether or not it's going to meet your requirements here in France. And there are a number of reasons for that. The, the main high level advantages are, do you want to, in France, continue to be ruled by HMRC and the UK government? Do you want to have a currency at risk because each time you take your pension in sterling, because UK pension funds can't pay in euros every month, you will have a currency risk. Um, do you want proper succession tax law planning on that pension for your spouse or partner um, and your children? Um, do you want to consolidate your pensions? Um, do you want to have a wider choice of funds? So I think it's important to say it's not a definite that you do something with it, but it's certainly worth looking at a review. Should it go into a cure ops? Should it go into an assurance V? Um, but it is really important that, that, that you take proper professional advice 
one of the things that I will mention, if, if you're retiring, one of the things we were concerned about with, with Brexit, if you were coming from the UK to anywhere out of the EU with a transfer on pension, you are currently subjected to an overseas tax charge of 25%. Currently, because they changed the rules to an EA territory, there is still no 25% OTC from the UK to France, but with the UK and every country with pandemic, government costs in debt, the, the easy target going forward for UK government and any government is of course pensions. So it's probably wise to review all your pensions before too long and certainly before the end of the year. But it's not a decision to be taken lightly. It is absolutely crucial to get proper advice um, from the proper source and make sure that you get a document that is clearly outlining the advantages, the disadvantages, the costs um, and added value. So yes, it, it's worth a review. Okie dokie, thanks very much. Um, Anthony, so there's been a lot reported in the press about people moving out of cities to the countryside, especially now more people are working from home. People wanting uh, bigger houses in the countryside with a home office and so on. Um, is this something you're finding in the southwest? And as you say, you've got a, a beautiful, you live in a beautiful part of France. So are there lots of Parisians moving down to the countryside? And if they are, all these city dwellers coming to the country, is it putting a squeeze on rural properties? Are there less available? Are prices going up or likely to go up? What are you finding? Um, in terms of people moving out of the cities in France, it's, it's certainly a big current trend that we're seeing and have seen for the last few months. Um, we've had buyers from pretty much all the major urban areas of France moving out of the cities, obviously for the open air and more space, uh, both young and old. So families who are still continuing to work um, and they're, they're obviously looking um, for schooling for the kids, home working facilities, so good internet, etc. That's all very important to them. Um, it's, it's meant that there's been, um, it's almost a new market to us, is the city dweller from France coming out to the, to the southwest. It's, it's, it's very unusual. Um, and we've had people, as I said, from all corners of the country. And what it's meant is that they've been able to get in on the ground Let's say we have we have peaks throughout the year and troughs where we have more activity in the in the market. Um, with what that's meant is that that those peaks have basically flattened out, so the market has continued throughout the whole year. So even through the the winter months, December, January, when we're historically fairly quiet, um, there were high levels of trading. Um, yes, it will make um, some or make going forward and the number of properties on market when. Uh, the international buyers, the Brits in particular, have the opportunity to travel and come out and look at property because a lot of what they probably could have bought or have, have been looking at online has actually sold. Um, and we've had you know, in recent in the recent past cases where we've had three, four buyers looking at the same property and bids above uh, asking price. Um, so inevitably, I think we're going to see an increase in price. I'm not sure that it'll be huge because... Uh, vast moves, movements in price in the rural areas doesn't doesn't generally happen, but I think we will see a, a small increase in property values and property prices moving forward this year, largely because of the lack of stock on market. Yes. Right. Okay. Then. And presumably, I mean, obviously, there's there's been fewer international buyers because of travel restrictions uh, and so on. But I'd imagine there's quite a few vendors who've been waiting to put their property on the market when they're more confident about having people coming to look at it. So hopefully that might balance things out a bit as well. We're hoping so. Um, we're, not, we're not at that point yet. We're hoping that there will be uh, more new property coming to market when people have a little bit more confidence moving forward and when travel is <laughs> a little bit easier as well, obviously. But that's something we'll see probably a couple of months down the line, I imagine when things are a little bit freer and easier. Thankfully, they, they've rolled out the COVID vaccination here a little bit more speedily than they did uh, in the early days. So it's, it's picking up for sure. Yeah, fingers crossed for a better summer for everyone. So George, 
Uh, another tax question. Someone's asked if they move to France but retain a rental property in the UK, are taxes likely to be higher in France than in the UK? Um, no, and the, the good old double taxation treaty between the UK and France means that quite simply the UK rental income is taxed only in the UK in France at the time of submitting your tax return, that income is added and declared that it's not taxed and a credit will be provided for the income tax or social charges that apply on your code. Um, and this applies even where there is no um, tax paid in the UK. And that's simply to determine what French tax you should pay on your other income. Um, but the answer is no, the double tax treaty will work quite easily for that but it is paid in, in, in the UK, uh, UK um, rental um, income tax. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there's another question from a UK tax resident who has both UK and Irish nationality, so therefore they have the right to live and travel throughout the UK, but they want to know what, if any, tax benefits they have from holding Irish nationality. So there are no tax benefits as such. Um, I see there's another question here from someone who's from Sweden, but what I would say is that an individual with an Irish nationality or an EU nationality citizen, the key point here is that freedom of movement and the other EU rights are retained. It's only for uh, UK that matters have changed as a result of Brexit. So that Irish national and will have no tax benefit, will have no difficulty in being able to move to France. Um, restrictions that apply to UK nationals post Brexit do not apply to them. Um, they will still have the same problems that everyone has, whether you're um, Scottish or whatever. Um, you still need to take proper advice from a succession point of view. Um, there are ways to mitigate that. There are ways to mitigate CGT. Um, capital gains tax and income tax, but certainly um, it's probably a good thing to have an Irish passport. Um, everybody should be trying to find out if they have any <laughs> link to Ireland at all, but there's no tax benefits, but there are other benefits. So keep a hold of that Irish passport, I would say. Okie dokie. And um, just sticking with you, George, for a moment, there's, um, we've had a couple of questions about people asking who should, um, be giving them tax advice and uh, without just sort of saying me, um, <laughs> what qualifications should they be looking for? And uh, somebody else was asking if their UK tax, uh, their UK financial advisor, they can still use them when they've moved to France or should they have someone based in France? So will I take the tax question first of all? Uh -huh. They're quite separate. At Blevins Franks, a lot of our strategic planning and wealth planning, of course, encompasses tax planning throughout all of the French tax law. Um, Blevins Franks are not um, accountants, but what we do have is a list of um, French and English speaking accountants throughout the re regions of the Dordogne. Um, we will refer individuals with the more complex scenarios to these um, accountants. It's really important, I suppose, unless you have a good grasp of French, that you have a good French-English accountant. The, the problem um, that I've come across with some French accountants, they, they sometimes don't, I don't want to say they don't understand their own French tax laws, but you know they, they do tend to make mistakes, they do tend to get things wrong. So it is really, really important that you're confident that who is qualified under the French tax laws to give you advice, then that, that, that you're comfortable with that. And we would assist in giving a, a, a reasonable list of a number of individuals to speak to, but it's really important that you take advice where required for complex matters from a French qualified accountant. Right. The second, question has become a little bit more difficult and we didn't see this coming or at least we did but the UK government didn't see it coming is that from the 1st of January the right to passport financial services banking 
credit institutions, IFAs, stockbrokers, ceased effectively from the 1st of January. And the ACPR, who's the bank regulator, have actually already sent out communication that, that it is illegal um, and not correct for a UK institution to give advice to a French tax resident at this stage. The other problem with the likes of the Standard Life, the old mutuals, etc., is that they all have to have adequate professional indemnity in place to protect their clients. Now that there is Brexit, that professional indemnity for the Financial Conduct Authority doesn't apply here in France. So all those individuals with the Fidelity, the Standard Life, the old mutuals, they need to review aspects because a lot of clients will have already been receiving letters from the likes of Barclays, Tilney to say, we can't look after you anymore. So it's really important that here in France that you receive advice from accountants who are qualified and from advisors who are regulated in France. Right, thanks, thanks George. Um, one come in here for Anthony, somebody looking to uh, renovate a French property. And they're asking, is it frowned upon if you do some of the work yourself with help from your own builder for standard work? And I presume they might mean from your own builder for standard work, they mean somebody they, they've used perhaps in the UK before. They do say they would still want to hire local French builders for more advanced work, for example, to refresh special features of the property to reflect the style, etc. And um, I know from my own experience that you need to be quite careful with electrics and um, plumbing. So, so what would your advice be on that? Um, I think the most important thing would be, well, there are two things really. One is if you're using French artisans, they have to have uh, a decimal guarantee, uh, which is a 10 year guarantee, which guarantees their work in case of any problems. If you're using a friend to do that, you don't have that guarantee. Um, so that goes for any construction work, electrical work, uh, even installing windows, for example. Um, for instance, if you sell your house before the 10 years are up, if you don't have these guarantees, you're carrying the guarantee and you give the guarantee to the per person who purchases from you. So you've got to be wary of things like that. Um, is there an impact on in the local community? One or two people look at or view it as rather odd that um, the Brits, they always employ their own builders or they, they bring people down to do it for them. Uh, yes, that does happen because it's a language thing, pure and simple. Uh, they find it easier and they find uh, that the English speaking trades can be more reliable time-wise. Um, so it, it, it's frowned upon by the French artisans more than anything else. Um, and the other thing to take into account when you're doing a renovation um, is, make sure you have the necessary building approval to do what you want to do. If you want to convert a barn into a house and change openings, uh, you need change of usage on that, on that building and you need to have full planning permission for any work that you're going to do. Um, so it's something that often people get caught out with selling houses that um, the international uh, buyers have owned for maybe 30, 40 years. And back in the time, they didn't necessarily need planning approval. They went to the local mayor, said, can we do this? He said, yeah, just go ahead. Well, they're tightening up on everything now. And we've had several issues in the last few months or year where um, that work that was done without approval comes before a notaire. And he says, what work have you done to the property? And they say, oh, we, we changed the barn into four bedrooms 30 years ago. Oh, sorry, we're going to have to apply for retrospective planning permission on it now. So lots of pitfalls um, to look out for when you when you and traps when you're doing your own renovations. OK, so you're protected if you've used French artisans with the correct insurance, the 10 year insurance. You've got that in place, whereas work you do yourself or or a, a, a friend builder you bought over from the UK, you won't have that um, cover, will you? So. Correct. So good advice there. Um, George, um, you touched upon, there was a question earlier from a couple who are Scottish and Swedish and both retired and planning to move to France. And they say they're tempted by Bergerac. So <laughs> um, they want to know what the tax implications are for them, particularly as they're not married and how that would 
affect their inheritance? How I presume they're saying how they would pass the property on to each other if they're not married. Yeah, so th that's something. So if you're talking about property, that's a separate issue from maybe other assets that they have. But the property, as I mentioned earlier, should at the point of purchase and certainly within the notaire's requirements when they're doing what they need to do, is that there's a en division or an ententine or some sort of contract put in place on the purchase documents. And that will enable them to ensure that both of them are protected and are allowed to live in the house for as long as they both live with then beneficiaries set up as to the children. It depends what, what children they have. Um, so it is possible to protect both of them by having the appropriate contract. And the notaire will normally sit down with you and ask you, do you have children? Where are they? What ages are they? Are they um, from past relationships? Um, not, not being married really in France is not um, pertinent to the purchase of the property. The French marital scenario, whether it's PACS or whether it's a civil um, or whether it's whatever, makes no difference, particularly with the purchase proper property. So it's important that you have the appropriate ententine or en division or in the property. The rest of the assets, pension, capital, that can all be dealt with with proper planning. Again, with beneficiaries, with usufruit, with um, all sorts of um, uh, scenarios available to us. So um, it's not something I would be concerned about because it is fixable, but you'd need to take advice. But most importantly, and Anthony will, will, will back me up on this, it's, it's critical that at the point that you purchase the house, that that property has the appropriate caveats, beneficiary scenarios put in place. It's too late to do it further down the line. Yeah, so it's very important to get the right advice at the start when you're buying the property from your agent, from the notary, and you may also want to take on a separate um, solicitor who's, who's um, experienced in dealing with the French property market for overseas buyers so you don't get caught out in all sorts of ways just right. get the advice is the, just, the advice is get advice I would say so okay um I think we've got time for a couple more questions um let's see we have um just one moment we have a question on are is there going to be a higher rate of French capital gains tax for UK residents who sell property in France post Brexit. So I guess that's one for George. Um, so if, if it's, well, this is a quite a complex subject and, and it depends. So if you have a UK property and you sell that UK property before you become a French tax resident, it will of course be subject to UK capital gains tax law, et cetera. If you become a French tax resident and then sell a UK property after that date, it is then subjected to French capital gains tax. And French capital gains tax runs at around about 30%. However, the rules changed from 2015 and it depends on how long you've held the property for. So if you've held a property for more than 21 years, there is no CGT. If you've held it for more than 30 years, there's no social charge. But if, if you haven't, you will be subjected to French CGT. It therefore would be appropriate to take advice from um, our task team or an accountant as to what would the CGT look like if you were to sell the property. And there are other rules that you get a certain period of time, 12 months to sell it before you come out, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a complex area, but the French CGT rules apply. It's 30% if you're a French tax resident. If you're a UK, then you're subject to UK CGT. And of course, in the UK, it's your main residence. There's no CGT. If it's a second property, it's not your main home. It will be subject to capital gains tax. So 
Um, I don't want to keep repeating the same thing, but it's important that you take proper advice before you sell it and when you sell it. Okie dokie. Um, great. Well, I think we're, we're running out of time now, so I think we'll, we'll wrap up there. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I do hope our, our webinar, 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 got my teeth back in, sorry. I do hope our, our webinar on tax and living in France and buying French property has um, been useful for you. If you've got any more questions, you can always contact us afterwards via email. So thanks to my fellow panelists, George and Anthony. Thanks also to our sponsor, Blevins Franks. For more information about France and French property, please do visit our websites, completefrance.com and francepropertyshop.com. You can also find information there about subscribing to our magazines, French Property News and France Magazine. Please do join us for our next webinar, which is on the 7th of July. We'll include details by email and you can also find out more on our French Property Exhibitions website. So thanks all for joining. See you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.